Hey everybody, welcome to another GMG review. Today we're taking a look at the Harry Potter miniature game from Night Models. Now, um, this is a board slash miniature game hybrid, I would say more Space Hulk probably or Hero Quest than it is um, a traditional sort of like build your own scenery and stuff war game set in the Harry Potter's wizarding universe. Uh, this starter set is the second edition of the starter set. There was a first edition um, that was launched through crowdfunding and this is sort of the shook out the bugs, um, you know, new components, better like um, cardboard version of the box. Uh, and it comes with two playable armies. Uh, both of which are roughly 24 galleons before you buy them upgrades. Uh, standard game size is for a small game, 30 ga galleons, um, an average game, 50 galleons, and then a large, like, huge mass battle or multiplayer game is like 75 to 100 galleons. Um, it does have a, uh, a sort of a, a cooperative mode as well, so you can play with people as opposed to having opposing forces. And of course, the forces themselves are aligned into heroes and villains. So you have the forces, you know, of you know who or Grindelwald or whatever, uh, versus the forces of, you know, the the Ministry of Magic and the the Wizarding Kids and whoever. All your favorite characters are in there. They have been done to the likenesses of the films, the Warner Brother films. So. Um, if you had your own sort of like vision of them in your head, uh, or your own vision of them, you know, from reading the books and stuff like that, these are going to reflect more of the films than um, maybe your own personal vision. So you do get, uh, I think it's six, ten, thirteen models, and we'll start with the important ones, the kids. So I'm just going to hold them up here. I paid all of them. Um, this is Harry. Uh, they're all done in a gray resin with standard night model flagstone sort of bases. Um, the only bits that were a little bit bent were just the wands, and they are super fine, as you can see. Uh, the Hermione was perfect. I had no issues with her at all. And this was the most important one for me to paint because my daughter would freak out if I didn't paint Hermione for her. And she's very excited about that. And then Ron, although it's appropriate lore-wise, he was the only one whose wand came out kind of bendy. But nothing was broken in the box. Everything was ready to rock and roll. Um, and I just glued them together and gave him some paint jobs. So there's the heroes. You also get four Death Eaters, just like generic name brand Death Eater dude in mask who doesn't really get like a, a name or anything like that um and there's uh there's two 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 female death eaters and two male death eaters so you do get a good mix of like whatever you want to paint um and i think they're actually maybe the same ones from the film because i know at one point there's a bunch of death eaters that like show up with um oh what's her name um lestrange the how about a carter character I haven't seen the films in a long time. Actually, that's a lie. I watched one of them recently with my kids, but I haven't seen most of them in a long time. And then you get um, a, a uh, Acromantula, I think it's called, and I'm gonna try and say it, and then five Acromantula swarms. Now these are actually not in resin, they're in hard plastic, the same material as the bases, which is interesting because they, one, they're all the same, but two, they're actually up, the only component in here that's not in resin. So they're all painted up, ready to play some games with. I had a lot of fun painting them. Um, and their likenesses are pretty, pretty spot on to the actual film. Then we open the thing, and let's see what we got here. So we got a rule book. Um, it's an A5 scale, which if you haven't seen these before, this is the same size as your old school starter set GW rule books. So like your Battle Let's Go Pass, or uh, what was the other one? Uh, Dark Vengeance? Yeah, not Dark Imperium, Dark Vengeance. But it had a rule book that was this size in there. Very popular size. So this is what we're gonna flip through. But I wanna show you all the components. Um, you get three board tiles that are all reversible, either like Hogwarts grounds um, or the outskirts, like the forest and stuff. And they are so nice. Like if you look at them right now, you can see there's, I'm catching a reflection off the studio lights on here, right? No reflection. They are super matte. They're matted all the way down, which it may seem like a little thing, but when you're recording games and you're trying to like deal with light and light balance and stuff like that, having a super matte reflective surface, it does two things. It makes it feel less like a board, although there, you do move in squares in this, so it is a bit space hulky. Um, but it also means that you don't have to worry about light reflection, which is like weirdly a huge deal for me. Um, and they all line up so you can kind of uh, put your boards different ways. It's a bit um, like Shades Bar in that regards where you can rearrange your boards and some missions will have like a preset board arrangement for you to do so and again they're all themed and this means too they can they can re uh, release separate boards later on and expand sort of like your your battleground size so it's nice because it's kitchen table size if you look at all three of these together you're probably oh geez these are about eight by this is about 16 by eight so if you're to put all these together you would have a 24 a one foot by 16 inch table if they're like all three sort of like laid out one two three like that um 
yeah, and then you get your little pad of foam here. Um, and you got two more sets of components. You have your, um, uh, what's it, the, the actual card terrain. So this would overlay on top of the card. And again, it's in a nice mat. Uh, and then you have your cards and stuff too. And you have a token set, and I've actually put the token set and punched it. I'm not gonna show it to you because it's all arranged like a container. Um, but the tokens are the same card stock as this. They're a nice thick, it looks like two mil or three mil card. There's a bit of plastic or something there. It's stuck to that, I have to take off. Um, which is nice and tough. It's not going to bend, right? It's it's a good a good quality cardboard. And I think when they're talking about improved component quality, it's probably this stuff and the tokens they're talking about. Uh, and I'm going to go through the token list in the book because it's just easier than me showing you all the tokens <laughs> separately. And then you have two, uh, or actually four kinds of large cards. You have your stack cards for all your characters, right? So there's your Death Eater. Um, and we'll do the anatomy of a card through the book and stuff. I've already sleeved these guys, so I'm not going to show up great on camera because I'm going to use them in games. Um, but I will talk about why I sleeved them because these, the card stock on the cards is pretty thin. I sleeved all the ones that need to be shuffled. So you have your event cards and your item cards, or sorry, your um, event cards and uh, I think it's item cards. Is it items or is it something else? Events and something else. Tactics maybe? There's there's basically two types of cards in here that happen during the game and they'll need to be shuffled and actually like dealt out. Oh sorry, it's secondary objectives. Secondary objectives and um, and uh, event cards. And so they needed to actually be a little bit more robust, but the, the punching and the edging on these, they're fairly thin card stock. So they don't feel, they're a bit thinner than playing cards. They feel a little bit like, um, Oh, how can I describe this? Like a uh, cereal packet. So they're about about the thickness of cereal packet. So I would recommend sleeving all of them. These ones are, they're just um, uh, scenario cards. So they're not gonna get shuffled and played with that way. So I wasn't too worried about sleeving these. These are like your, what your, your, your job is basically that you're doing in the game. So I'm not so worried about them because they're not gonna get like dealt out randomly. Uh, but I do need to get some little sleeves for these because these are your equipment cards and spell cards. So these are your, uh, there's your equipment and spells. I think these are equipment, uh, yep. And then these, uh, this is a random thing. <laughs> and then these should all be spells. Uh, nope, these are more equipment things, or unless these are actually not organized. Oh no, never mind. When they come out, they think they're alphabetized and they're not actually organized by backing. Yeah, but these need to be, and there's potions and stuff too. And these are, these are things you attach to your characters during the game. Um, so I'm, again, they don't get dealt out. I'm not super worried about them, but I don't want to have them get wrecked. Uh, and there's a little organizer in here. I'm not using it because I'm using a big uh, sort of like plastic tote for all the tokens and stuff. Uh, but you can put your stuff back in here if you want. So there's the components uh, minus the tokens because I'm going to show you that just in the book because it's going to be way easier to look at them that way. <laughs> Let's put all this stuff back in the tin. Uh, and let's take a look at the actual book and the rules. Um, and we'll go over the rule set and to talk about how it works. Because this is an AP based um, move on a grid um, miniature board game hybrid where you do get to build out your character. So it is character driven, which means that your characters themselves are going to be um, uh, fairly customizable. So you, they have like a basic stat line and then you can actually customize them to be what you want. So. What do we got here? Components and your assembly instructions are actually in this book. There's like a separate assembly instructions thing. Uh, and then your game overview. So like the basics of like what a character card is, just realized this was still in the shot. Uh, what a character card is, um, the phase of the game, your challenges. So like the terrain and your markers and stuff. Um, those are the cardboard bits that, that are either the board themselves or that go on top of the board. Um, how to build a group, uh, special rules. So all special rules things have the different game modes, which is your, um, your ways that you can play the game basically cooperatively or head to head and then scenarios, which is all the, the different scenarios. So what comes in the box? Your assembly instructions are pretty brief. They're just like a page. Um, but what was really nice and I will compliment Knight for this, uh, every piece where I wasn't sure who it belonged to has a different, if you look here, a different fitting style. So you can't mess up Ron and, um, and uh, Harry's legs because Ron has a double peg and he has a single peg to go in and actually fit it. So as long as you're paying attention like what the components look like, you can't actually mess up um, what goes where, which is really handy. Same with these guys. They have different um, pegs for their, their legs and torsos and arms and stuff like that. So you actually can't mess them up, which is, which is great. I mean, there's assembly instructions here, but if you were just kind of like wigging it, if you just pulled them open and started to put them together, you'd be fine pretty much no matter what. Um, you got all your components here. So objective markers, there's like colored objective markers for everything from like the golden snitch to rings to amulets to 
um, the Pensier, all that stuff. Uh, you've got your damage markers. Now the damage markers are interesting. So you see it goes yellow, orange, purple, pink. Um, they work a lot like the damage markers did in Confrontation, if you ever played that game, where you don't have a hit point stat, you have a wound level. So it's basically light, moderately, severely, and then critically injured. Those are the colors. So like a light wound is orange, um, a, uh, a moderate wound is, or sorry, light wound is yellow, moderate wound is orange, and then like a severe uh, wound would be purple, and a critical wound would be pink. And if you get wounded again when you're critically wounded, you're taken out. So it's kind of neat because it's it's not a hit point based game. You don't have things with tons of hit points. You just have like how injured are you basically um, going down. You got your cooldown clocks, which are for all your spells. So um, when you cast a spell, for instance, it might have to cool down for several turns before you can cast it again. They get placed on the spell card and then flipped. Power points for light or dark magic. When you uh, build the power pool at the start of the turn, there's only so much magical energy like in the air, and that means that you have to. Um, to you know, basically like conserve or budget how you're going to be casting your spells, and then your effects markers, the usual type of effects markers, so like burning, poisoned, um, stunned, whatever you want, Did whatever happens. Uh, you can summon Patronuses, which is cool. So you have the otter. Is it an otter Patronus? Or is it a cat? I can't remember. And you have the stat, you have Harry's Patronus there. And then your Acromantula markers for cooperative mode. You don't have to use the miniatures. They are actually markers for everything in here as well. Um, same with character markers. You don't have to use the miniatures for any of this. You, if you didn't want to, if, like, if you bought this box and you were not interested in Toy Soldiers at all, you could actually still play the game just in cardboard, which is a very handy thing. Like if you wanted to teach someone, um, Okay, this is a gift for someone who's a board gamer and not necessarily a tabletop gamer. The miniatures could literally just be extraneous and you could play the game with just, just the markers that come in the box. Um, and I think that's a handy, uh, a handy sort of like, just, it, it doesn't cost really anything to put those markers in there. It's just that using a little bit of extra space on, the, on the, the token sheets. And think about how much that opens up a potential customer base, right? I think that's something that should be really, it should actually be talked about louder on the packaging and in the advertising for this game is that you can play it as a miniature hybrid or you could just straight up play it as a board game too. Because that's a, uh, and I hope the tokens come in later on with like new character packs and stuff like that too because I, I feel like being able to do it both ways just broadens your market. This can be a great board game for people that aren't miniature gamers. You get your dice, uh, dark and light dice, and they all have a symbol you'll see on them here. And that what the symbol represents is your exploding dice. So the six is always a symbol. And six is always exploded in this game. You get your campaign cards, event cards, quest cards, adventure cards, artifact cards, that's what they're called, not equipment, artifact cards, potions, and then spell cards. Um, and the spell cards are all dark or light, marked on the back and stuff too. And you got all your game boards and your overlays, which is the scenery pieces that come in the box. Now you'll notice through the art here in the pictures, there are tons of other characters in the game, um, just as there are tons of other characters in the book. So this is a very expandable game, and all of the characters when you purchase them come with the accessories and stuff, the cards and whatever that you're gonna need to play with them. So um, everything's an expansion for this core set, and this core set is uh, required to play. Um, so yeah, so looking at the miniatures, setting up the boards, uh, this is just giving you an example board that you can set up for your first game, uh, and then your game overview. So the round sequence, you have a start phase which and an end phase, and I'm not going to talk too much about them because they're basically, they're exactly what you think they are. They're, some things happen in the start phase, like at the start of the turn, do them now, or some things like lingering effects take place in the end phase, do them now. Um, and then you have your, manage, uh, your magic phase, initiative phase, and your activation phase. The first two are pretty short. In the magic phase, whatever your power pool is, fills up, so light and dark magic fills up. If you have any spells that need to be upkept, they get upkept then, and then you advance the cooldown clock. So any spells that were cooling down, you'd flip the token to see if they, they get cooler, or see, see if they can be cast again. Um, and the initiative phase is, again, really simple. Um, everybody has a stat called cunning, and cunning is kind of like your speed or your ability to think on your feet. Um, the highest total cunning available on the board is the person with the initiative, and if it's tied, the heroes go first. They give it to the good guys, because why not? Um, and then you have activation phase. And your activation phase is where everything else happens, and all your characters go back and forth activating, and doing um, a simple and a long, basically short and long action each. They get one, one advanced or one complicated one. Uh, counting rages, super simple, just counting squares to where you're going. Adjacent spaces, uh, different for big guys and little guys, obviously. So like the giant slugs, all of these squares are adjacent, a regular dude. They're adjacent. Uh, and then dice rolls are dice pools um, looking for a target number usually. So if you have an ability, a stat, that's how many dice you're rolling in your dice pool. Every three is a success. Um, and uh, basically you're counting up successes to see if you hit your target number and, and achieve it or not. Um, 
Six explode, so they give you an additional die. They count as a success and give you an additional die to roll again. Uh, Rerolls, in some situations, the rules allow you to reroll. This is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, mystery dice. So now sometimes uh, there's like a, a, a random occurrence. Something crazy happens. If you put a mystery, so there's there's two dice of mystery dice. There's a lucky one and a jinxed one, and you put them in your dice pool. Uh, you roll them all alongside the dice with your roll, and um, when you get a lucky mystery die, you get to discard the lowest die in your roll and then keep the mystery die if it's one of your successes. A jinxed one, however, uh, you must choose, um, however, when selecting dice for the final result, you always choose the ones with the lowest scores. So you drop your highest dice when you're jinxed. So it's basically advantage in D&D. You roll an extra die. If you're at disadvantage, you discard the high one. If you um, are at advantage, you score the, 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 the drop the lowest one. Uh, when a symbol is scored, first resolve the effects of the mystery dice, and then if any symbols remain, resolve it. So unfortunately, your exploding dice can go away if you're jinxed, which is a bummer. Uh, and then line of sight, it's basically from one of your corners to two of someone else's corners. So you can see along an obstruction. If you can see to two corners, then that person can see that person. In this case, they can't because it's only one corner to one corner. So from one of your own corners to two of their corners, it's a pretty simple line of sight system. Uh, and then more blocking line of sight. Uh, models who are friendly in the way are ignored. And the character card. Okay, so uh, you've got all kinds of different like factions. Hogwarts, Death Eaters, and Magical Creatures are the three main ones, but sometimes you can be two factions at the same time, right? Sometimes you can be Hogwarts and a Death Eater, sometimes you can be a Magical Creature and a Death Eater, or Hogwarts and a Magical Creature, right? So you can have dual faction things that exist in the same, the same one. Uh, and then who are you? So your name, your Hermione, um, you're now they've, they've gone a long way to make this game not have to have a ton of translation done on it. So you have three stats, Mastery, Defense, and Cunning. Um, it, mastery and Defense are symbols, not numbers. I wish they were numbers. Uh, they, they're not super easy to tell sometimes. So your Mastery here is two wands. That means you roll two dice when you cast a spell. Uh, your um, Defense is two shields. So you're gonna roll two dice when you defend against stuff. It's yeah, I get why, I get why you put in symbols instead, but the first time I looked at a card before I saw this page, I had a really hard time intuitively digesting what was on there. Um, just do numbers. Like, it's it's fine. <laughs> they could The number could just be inside a wand or inside a shield, and you would still get that, you would still communicate that, and most numbers are fairly universal. I don't think it needs symbology. I get why you do it artistically and to make it easier to translate, but at the same time, it's not doing it for me. <laughs> you got your galleon cost, which is um, how much you cost to recruit in an army. Um, and of course your equipment stuff is galleons too. So you have like the base cost for your models basically, plus whatever it costs to recruit people. All your traits, your special rules. So she's an apprentice, she's from Gryffindor, she's a potioner. She has the potioner skill basically when she resolves potions. Other stats, she's magic six, temper five, um, your courage four and wisdom seven. They're all what they sound like. They're stats basically for uh, creating a target number almost when they do something in that regard. Uh, so their temper basically is like a, a number to beat, their courage is a number to beat, et cetera, et cetera. And then people usually have an, a, a, a basic spell or ability in here too. So like if something was like attacking with claws, it's claws would probably be this card. Um, Hermione is counterspell as a basic spell. Um, it has a range of four, so anyone within four squares of her, she can attempt to counter a spell as a reaction. It costs three neutral magic, so not light or dark, it just can be from anywhere. Um, it has a cooldown of three, so you put the cooldown counter there and you have to flip it three times. So you have to flip, you put down three cooldown markers and you have to flip three of them to basically to, to have it happen. Um, it's got no upkeep, you can't upkeep it, and then its difficulty is question mark because its difficulty is set by the, the description. Models within range cast a spell, difficulty is equal to the number of power points used to cast the trigger spell, uh, plus one. So if successful trigger spell automatically fails. So if someone uses three, it would be difficulty three and then plus one. So it's always, a, you have to beat basically whatever their, 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 their casting thing that they put into it was. Um, and that's the basics of a card. The only other things that you probably wouldn't get just by looking at this are these little kind of like divots in the card or where you put stuff. So for this one right here, it's equipment. No, this one's spells actually, and this one's equipment. 13 is equipment, you put equipment on top and then spells on the bottom. So when you buy your upgrades, you have to, you have to attach them somewhere on the card and certain people have different um, uh, amounts they can attach. Not everybody basically can carry the same amount of equipment. Uh, and then yeah, the really important bit, the special rule, if you, if you can't agree, roll four plus. 
<laughs> uh, so describe the start phase, magic phase, and then your initiative phases. So adding up cunning, as I said. And then activation. So now you're activating a model. Uh, you have basic one basic and one advanced action. So basic actions are things like move or use a potion. Advanced actions are things like attack in melee or use a spell. And then free actions are things that are free. They'll usually say they're free on their cards. So if you have a piece of equipment or something like that that gives you a free action, they don't cost any of your, your actions in the game. Uh, moving to squares, so like just descriptions of movement, how do you move around the table, uh, and then how do you do an attack? So performing an attack, um, you make an attack roll, so you add whatever your bonus value is to the success is scored. So like let's say you have a, um, uh, a weapon that has an, a bonus to your attack dice, you'd use whatever your skill is that's, that's supposed to be there for using that, and then roll that enemy dice. Looking for three pluses, sixes would explode. Your opponent would then roll their defense roll, which is adding the number of shields to its defense characters to its successes. So you make, it's always three dice basically, plus the number of your stats. So like if Hermione casts a spell, your dice pool is three, you roll three three pluses, um, you have exploding sixes, and then you add your stats. So she's got two wands, meaning if she was gonna make a, actually not, not a good example, because she's not fighting in melee. Let's say the rats, the rats have a attack card with like, a, I think an attack value of like one or two. Uh, and then they have whatever their, their mastery or their ability skill is. They would roll three dice for their test for an attack and then add one or two. Your opponent would then roll three dice to try and defend and add whatever their number of shields is. So Hermione adds two to all of her defense rolls and two to all of her casting rolls, basically. And then you take damage. Um, if the attacker has at least one success remain, the target, mar target marker or target model suffers a damage. So you never typically suffer that many uh, pieces of damage unless something says it does more damage than one and you would go if you took one you would go to light if you took two you'd go directly to moderate if you took three you'd go to um, uh, severe and if you take uh, four you go right to critical and you put you'd stay there and push to the next one the next time you take damage uh, there's many spells that removes uh, and heal damage in the game uh, you work backwards the same way so if you heal two damage like let's say you're critical lead you'd go to moderate damage and go backwards and the colored symbols are just there to, to mark how much damage you currently have we already talked about these. Now there also are, so there's light and dark spells and then neutral. They're all marked in the bottom there with when you cast them. Um, you also have unforgivable curses. So there's three, Crucio, Imperio, and Ava Avada Kedavra. Uh, and you can only cast these spells if you have the dark arts trait. And not even all of the Death Eaters have the dark arts trait because some of them are afraid to actually cast the unforgivable curses. But there's a few and they'll do it. And the cost is huge, but hey, you could just do two magical damage. <laughs> That's a combat spell. It's difficulty one, which means it only needs one white or one black power to do. So Crucio is like horrifying, but it does cool down for two. So you can't use it every single round. Um, and then, uh, like I already went through the, the different stats for these things. Um, they're, they're pretty intuitive once you start using them. Uh, some are reactions. Hermione's counter spell that I described earlier is a reaction. It means that you can cast it when the trigger is made. So the reaction model within range casts the spell. Uh, your spell book, as I described earlier, so you attach them at the bottom there. You can take up to your number of slots, basically. Uh, and then the power pool, and the power pool, of course, is players, uh, sorry, um, each player maintains a magical reserve re represented by a pool. Players should keep their power point totals next to the cards of their group so that they can um, see how many power points they have remaining. And whether they're light or dark, it's replenished at the start of each magic phase. In this phase, each player adds the power tokens equal to the cunning value of all their models. So, like, uh, Harry brings in two light um, what should we call it, power into the, into the stat pool. Um, so does Hermione, right? So she's gonna bring in, I think Rhonda's too as well. So you'd have six light power basically to spend by everybody in the power pool. Uh, if the model is a white icon, the tokens must be light. If it's black, they must be dark. If the icon is half black and half white, the player can choose if they'll be light or dark. However, once points are allocated, you cannot change them during the round. Uh, and then casting spells. So the casting procedure, you're gonna pay the power points. Select a spell, uh, the cooldown clock must be in blue ready. All the conditions for casting the spell must be met before continuing. Uh, declare the cast spell action using one advance action. Spend a number of power points equal to its cost. Resolve the opponent's reaction if they have one. If they have no reaction or fail to counter, continue. And then take the casting roll. If it's successful, um, continue. If the roll fails, the action ends. And then resolve the description. So yeah, you can see here, the these are the cooldowns if you place them on top. Oh, and you actually do them clockwise. There we go. So uh, you'd place them. So the cooldown clock is a special double-sided counter to measure cooldown. If it's ready, it's blue if it's ready to go. And then it's how many turns does it take actually for it to um, cool down when you place it until it gets back to the top. So like if it was one turn, you would place it to the left. 
So the second round after casting a spell, ready to cast again. And you basically set it to however many turns it needs to go before it comes back to blue. And when it's at the top, it turns back to blue. I, I liked my idea of number of tokens better. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that'd be easier to manage, but the turning works too. That's a mechanic. That's just a funny mechanic because it's a mechanic that if you accidentally bump your board, like if you accidentally bump all of your stuff, you're going to have a hard time remembering where you were potentially. Whereas if you just put down three tokens, like for your cooldown, and then flip, flip them all to red, and then flip them all back to blue as you cooled down, you'd be ready to go again. You know what I mean? Like you just put the cooldown token next to it instead. We'll see which one I end up playing with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make a casting roll, do combat shields. Um, and sorry, you make defense rolls against combat spells. They're treated like normal, ordinary attacks, and you would make a defense roll against them. So uh, some spells, if it's just like a, if it's like an effect spell, it's not a combat uh, spell, you wouldn't make the defense roll. It would just happen. Um, if it is a uh, combat spell, then you get to make a defense roll against it. Potions. So types of potions, these are neat. They cost galleons, of course, their name. So polyjuice potion, sweet. Uh, the range zero means self. If it's ever range zero, if it's range um, anything higher than that, you can use it on other people. Uh, the description and whatever its level is, it's a level one spell. Um, potion guards are kept next to models item slots. You can carry up to one potion with a maximum level of one. Uh, and then description, the user gains concealment uh, slash 12 until performing any attack, uh, casts a spell, or receives damage. Because you disguise yourself as somebody else. You turn into Crab and Goyle. That's, that's what happens, man. When you're Crab and Goyle, nobody knows who you are. Um, and the, the use potion is a, a simple action, so it can replace your movement, basically. You can move or use a potion. It doesn't have to be your attacker or, or complex action. And then challenges. A challenge is one of the most common ways of scoring points. Typically, it's how you're going to score VPs. Uh, it's always centered on a target point, either a marker or another model or clue to find space in the game board. When you encounter a challenge, you will see that the characteristic has a numeric value, for instance, temper 12. Uh, to resolve a challenge, you simply need to have enough models in three spaces of the target point, whose combined total is higher than the challenge rating. So like, for instance, Hermione has a temper of 5. Um, if you got, if it was temper 12, you would need Hermione plus someone with a temper of 7 or higher, and then you resolve the challenge automatically. So. Think of it almost like a volume um, for whatever that stat is, and that's how you're going it, to... It's used in other ways too, but in this case it's going to be used for if you have a node on the table, they might need to be scored in different ways, and so you need to have characters of a certain um, stat level basically to go and do it. And then you get your train, so all of your difficult train, uh, which is things like... So open is anywhere on the table that's not covered by one of these things. Uh, and the border actually will dictate whether it's um, an obstacle, impassable, or difficult. Uh, so terrain tapes delineated by uh, borders on one or more edges of the space are fully bounded by the same border. All spaces within a boundary count as that type of terrain. So a dashed black border is difficult. So this bush, you can move through it, um, but the tree is two spaces of movement. So you move two basically to move one inside this. Impassable has a solid black border, so like this collapsed um, Quidditch tent is like an impassable train, but you see it divots in there actually, so that's an open square right there. Everything else is going to be impassable. And then an obstacle has a solid black border, um, and obstacles are distinguished by impassable train because they're marked with a single black edge, so it's something like a wall basically, so you wouldn't be able to walk through a wall. So you have to pay, you have to pay attention because some of the boards do have like bits of train on them that you maybe can or can't move through, and then all of the other obstacles will be delineated to tell you what they are. Uh, markers, so the Patronus marker. Oh, what does it do? It has very special effects. You gain a plus defense and cannot be the target of attacks by a Dementor. Well, oh, the Dementors run away, that's funny. They cannot move within two spaces of a Patronus Marker. If a Patronus Marker is placed within two spaces of a Dementor model, then they're pushed directly away. So they run away from the light, that's great. That's so Harry Potter. The, the Dementors don't like the, the bright stag man. Uh, and then we get on now to organizing your group. So the core mechanics of the game are pretty simple. Spend AP to move around, do usually what it says on your card. And most of the core, especially, except for in the back here, we're gonna get to like the traits and stuff, which I won't go through all of them. Um, you've got uh, most of what is happening in the game explained on the accessories in front of you. So not super complicated so far. It's a, it's a, a standard move around through AP. Uh, organizing your group, so you have your galleon limits. Quick game is 30, that's what you'll see me play in the Let's Play, because that's what you get in the box, basically, is two 30 galleon groups once they buy their upgrades. Uh, standard is 50, so I'd need an expansion or two, basically, to, to take this up to 50 to play a full-size game. 
Uh, and then named characters. Anyone with a named character can only be included once. Uh, you may not include more than one model of the name in the same group. So you only get one Harry Potter, obviously, only one Dumbledore. And that's important, actually, because Dumbledore, Albus Dumbledore, exists in multiple timelines. So you can use him as the Crimes of Grindelwald um, Dumbledore, where he's young, he's Professor Dumbledore, and then he can be the Professor Dumbledore from Hogwarts, as you know, the Richard Harris one, the super old one. Uh, I'm a Richard Harris Dumbledore fan. He's my favorite Dumbledore. Uh, <laughs> you have all your upgrades, uh, artifacts and potions. A model may carry any number of common cards, up to two rare cards and a single legendary card. And some cards, of course, have an affiliation, like dark or light. So you have to give them to the right people. Special rules, all your traits. Animaguses. This model can switch between two forms. That's cool. Uh, and then apprentices, this model may use one free power point of any color in each of its activations, but it cannot add lucky mystery dice to its casting rolls. Because they're apprentices, because they're kids. So Harry, Ron, and um, uh, Hermione can't use lucky dice in their casting rolls, but they got a free power. That's pretty cool. Uh, I like the Animagus. People can turn into to animals. When the ca character's activated, you can choose which form it will assume, human or animal. So you can have um, Sirius Black turn into the dog, which is, I mean, super appropriate. You can have, what's his name? The... Uh, uh, rat man. Scabbers. Scabbers is human form. I'm just gonna call him Scabbers because because who cares? He was the Weasley little man. Uh, and these are all the rest of your traits. So dark arts can use unforgivable, unforgivable curses. Chosen one. This is uh, Harry. This model gains a lucky mystery die. It's defense rolls. In addition, the model gains plus one defense against combat spells cast by Voldemort because he's a Horcrux. Um, so Harry, I don't think has the uh, the apprentice tag. I'm not gonna go back in the box to look, but I'm assuming if he has chosen one and can't, he wouldn't be an apprentice and get a lucky mystery die if he can't use it. Um, and then yeah, dueling. This trait will be appear in a future expansion. Okay, cool. Herbology expert. What does the potion expert do that Hermione has? Uh, potion mastery X. This model and all the models in the same group can carry X potions instead of just one, as long as they have sufficient item slots. If there are several models of this trait in the same group, choose the highest value. The potion, uh, the bonus remains in effect even if this model is removed from play. I think she's only potion one though. Why would they do that? Why would if they can always have a potion? Why would they only have one? What is her What does her stat card say? She is potioner. Sorry, never mind. P potion master. Potioner. Potioner, this model and all friendly models in the same group may purchase and carry potions up to level X when choosing the group. Okay, there you go. So they're allowed, she's allowed to buy level one potions because she's a potioner level one, because she's the one brewing them, obviously. There we go. Uh, and the potion your value is also used in some instances to provide other bonuses when using potions, okay? So in her case, everyone can always buy a level one potion, so her potioner benefit doesn't really add anything, but it might give her a benefit when using potions herself. That's cool. Supreme Mugwump, once per round when this model casts a spell, the power costs reduced by one. That's hilarious. Werewolf rules, burning, petrifying, poison, slow, reducing your move action. And then your event cards, these are all the random events. Unless otherwise instructed by the scenario, the first player to activate a model each round draws a card from the event deck and applies the results. So you always have an event happen every turn. Uh, at the start of each round, eat before initiative determined, select one player at random. That player draws three cards from the adventure deck and places them face up beside the game board. When the player who goes second in the round activates a model, they may pick what adventure card to use it. Um, discard the card after use. Each time a model is uh, activated subsequently, its player may pick a card. So if you're going second, basically the adventure cards give you a bonus if you're on the back foot. Um, and there's only three of them each round that each player gets to use. Uh, sorry, combined, everyone gets to use. So it would mean that if there's three adventure cards per round, the, sec the, the player without initiative gets two bonuses to the one that the, um, the main person gets. And then your quest cards, unless otherwise instructed by the scenario, uh, both players must draw three cards from the quest deck at the start of the game. Each player can choose to discard one and draw a replacement. Once all players have their cards, they are placed face up next to the game board and remain in play until the quest details on the card are fulfilled. When a quest card is fulfilled, another quest card is drawn. Uh, however, players cannot draw more than six replacement quest cards during a game. So you've got your sub, your secondaries, basically. And then additional cards. Uh, the adventure packs contain additional events, cards, etc., etc., etc. And then you've got game modes. So you have a duel. It's head-to-heads, you've got campaign, where you're trying to tell a story, and then you've got cooperative play. Um, we'll probably start off with duels, and then maybe move on to campaigns. And for, yeah, for just additional explanation for campaign stuff, for how you, like, you do things in order and learn, and then um, your difficulty for your campaign, too. Different scenarios, and then cooperative play rules. 
In this game, one or more players form a single group, battling against a variety of magical threats and fantastic beasts, playing solo or as part of a team, the environment itself becomes dangerous. That's what these arachnomantra ranchulas are probably being used for. Uh, use the usual setups. As the group, uh, at the choose your group stage of the adventure, each player chooses a single model of 15 galleons. All models must have the same affiliation or considered a single group. Uh, the number of magical creatures you must face is determined by the number of players in your group. Take all magical creature cards. Uh, each magical creature has a sickle cost of one, two, or three. This cost is used to create the deck. The more magical creatures in your collection, the better. So basically, it's, it's always going to be you against magical creatures if you're playing as a solo or a cooperative mode. Um, and that's, that's a neat addition. I like the idea that you can play it solo, and it gives you more value for picking up those magical creatures and having a a bonus sort of like um, collection of the monsters and stuff like that. It's not just scenario pieces, they get used for other stuff too. There you go, and there's lots of cooperative scenarios. Danger in the forest, troll in the dungeon, it's gonna be a troll in the dungeon. <laughs> and here's the basic scenarios. The Forbidden Forest, the Battle of Hogwarts, these all sound familiar. Uh, Malfoy Manor, also familiar. The Wedding, Fall of the Wizard. Death Chamber Battle, ooh geez. Death of Pre Prefect, and the Challenge, the Owlery, Havoc at Hogwarts, Riddle of the Stones, Winter at Hogsmeade. That's lots of scenarios. I think that's like nine or ten scenarios. Um, each with its own map and victory conditions. And that's it. So there's the core mechanics and a overview of the Harry Potter miniature game. Um, there is plenty to dig into here, and obviously the big bonus is that there's always going to be more content coming out. Um, with your favorite characters until all the characters in the books and the movies are covered, I guess. Uh, the new Crimes of Grindelwald, um, Fantastic Beasts, and um, that sort of like uh, uh, timeline stuff too, of course, adding to the game too, using the same core mechanics. So if you're a Harry Potter fan, I can't say that the, uh, the miniatures aren't fantastic. They did great justice to the uh, likenesses of everybody from the film. And the game looks like it's fun. This looks like a game I want to play with my kids. Uh, I'm going to play with people who are probably more casual miniature gamers, not hardcore miniature gamers, because you don't need a lot. You can pick your favorite character from the movie, buy them equipment, and then have an adventure. And the fact that it's a cooperative play too, not just a head-to-head um, -head battle, means it's a great way to introduce people to the game without having to, to be adversarial. You can cooperate with each other to try and learn the core mechanics and stuff too. So. I'm excited about it. We're going to give it a try, um, and you'll be able to check out a Let's Play relatively soon. Um, the quality of the tin was really nice too. It was nice to have a package that was... Um, that was a bit bespoke. Like, I like the fact that it came in like a cookie tin. This, we had, when I was growing up, this would be called a muffin tin, because you would put muffins in these things. My mom would bake muffins and, or cookies, and you would take these to like family functions or whatever. Uh, I don't know, it, it speaks to me. I don't know if it speaks to other people, but I grew up in a time where these things were like a thing that you had in your house. And it feels very Harry Potter, where it's got that kind of like, not old fashionedness, but like quaintness to it. So that's a nice little detail. Um, and then, of course, people have been talking online just about the 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 quality of the um, Kickstarter one versus this one. Uh, if you didn't pick this up via the Kickstarter, this is fantastic quality like board game component stuff. The the tokens are really nice. The boards in particular are fantastic. Like this matte finish is super high quality. So. I don't have any reservations about um, saying that the quality of the box looks really good. Uh, is the game fun? Haven't played it yet. Don't know, but the core mechanics look simple and easy to understand. Uh, and with an expanding roster of content, like different attachments and upgrades and spells and stuff, I think it's going to be neat. It looks like a um, character-driven, sort of like IP-based kind of a Shadespire game, but with the option to have a cooperative play too, whereas Shadespire is always adversarial, this has some cooperative mechanics and stuff as well uh, to go along with the fact that you might have your favorite character from Harry Potter in here. So uh, there it is, a review and uh, my sort of two cents overview of the Harry Potter miniature game. You can look forward to a Let's Play coming soon where we actually throw down and give it a shot so you can uh, hold off your opinions until then too if you want when you actually see it in play. And that's what I'm gonna be doing for um, when I think it's fun because obviously I need to give it a try first. But everything's ready to go, so you should see that soon. So anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you for another GMG review in the future. Next time I'm Ash, I'm programming. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe and hit the little bell below so you get notifications when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirts, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Death Ray Designs. Um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible. Uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else. And most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, big thanks to everyone past, future who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can.